So this is a lecture called Five Glaciers I Have Known, which was given on Saturday the 19th of January 2019. So I thought it would be quite a nice idea to re-show this uh, lecture, the slides, uh, with some commentary. The initial idea for the lecture was uh, about glaciation and glaciers. And there were two reasons for this. The first reason was that glaciers, glaciation is a topic that we teach in school. So pupils will be uh, required to have a, a knowledge of them. Uh, GCSE, A level and a key stage three at the moment we teach some glaciation in, in the third year. But also glaciers and glaciation as a broader topic is an interesting topic and um, we live in a, an area of the world with lots of glacial landscapes um, and glaciers and glaciation is a good topic to look at in terms of broadening uh, anybody's knowledge about the world uh, and the landscapes around them. So that was the uh, initial idea. The lecture itself was based upon the idea that I've got five different glaciers that have been visited and each glacier tells a different story. So we're going to begin with looking at what a glacier is. A glacier is a mass of ice, irrespective of size, derived largely from snow and continuously moving from higher to lower ground. That's a good definition there uh, from, from a website. The idea here being that ice and snow build up and uh, if they get big enough, they get form what we call a glacier and uh, glaciers move though that's really important glaciers move downhill under the force of gravity of course during the last ice age there were glaciers all over the world in various parts of the world that are not having glaciers now but nowadays glaciers aren't found in many places really um, so we need to look at where glaciers are found and why they are there obviously it needs snow it needs snow then to build up and form ice. So glaciers are only really found in cold places, not just cold places, places that are cold enough over a long enough period of time for the snow and ice not to melt away. Now there are two particular types or categories of place where this happens at the moment in the world. And these are places with particular latitude, high latitude or altitude, high altitude. Latitude, of course, is distance north and south from the equator, horizontal lines moving away from the equator. Places close to the equator, we say have a low latitude. Places close to the poles have higher latitudes. And we find that places with high latitudes, close to the north and south pole, as it were, there are obviously a lot colder. So high latitude places have more chance of having the cold conditions to have snow and ice accumulating and staying. In this case, places like Greenland and Antarctica have glaciers. However, we do get some glaciers in lower latitudes, so parts of the world would expect to have a more of a warmer climate. And this is because of height above sea level or altitude. If you go up high up in a mountain, it gets colder. So places such as the Himalayas, the Alps and the Andes, these are places at relatively low or mid latitudes, but because they're high up, because they're mountainous, it's cold and therefore ice and snow have collected and we find glaciers there. The next map shows this really well. Here's a map. The blue areas are where there's glaciers, uh, ice, uh, etc. On the left hand side, I've put down high latitude and this shows us that Greenland and Antarctica, well, they have glaciers and you can see from the map, they are far from the equator. They are up to the north, down to the south quite a way in high latitudes. So Greenland, Antarctica, high latitude areas for glacial formation. On the right hand side, it says high altitude. And here we've got the Alps, the Himalayas and the Andes as examples of places where we find glaciers uh, in, the, in the modern world. But if you look at their latitudes, they're found in latitudes where places have not got cold conditions. Look at the Alps there, sort of you know, southern Europe, north, near the Mediterranean basin, places where we would not normally expect to find snow and ice at sea level. The Himalayas, they're found on a latitude, again, very similar to northern Africa and Mediterranean basin. And the Andes down there, they're on a similar latitude, some parts of the Andes, to South Africa and Central Australia, areas with hot deserts. So that map shows really well that glaciers are found in areas of high latitude or high altitude, because that's where you get the conditions that are cold enough for the accumulation of snow and ice, and it doesn't all melt away. So we're going to look at five different glaciers. Each glacier tells a slightly different story.
I'm going to start off with the Franz Joseph Glacier in New Zealand, and that will tell us a story about how glaciers are dynamic, they grow, advance and shrink, retreat. Then Solheimer Jokul in Iceland. Often people think of glaciers as being clean and pristine, white, dry. Often films portray them this way, but they're not. If you go there, they're full of dirt as such. I'm going to use a different, more technical term for dirt later on. And running water. They're not dry, they're not white, they're dirty, wet places. Then we've got Perito Marino in Argentina. Uh, and glaciers change as they age, they don't stay the same. So as they get older, as humans and animals and vegetation, as it ages, it will change. And we'll look at how colour can show us this. Then we've got the Grey Glacier in Chile. Now glaciers often can be vast, huge areas of ice. And small changes can be very important and shouldn't be overlooked. And the Grey Glacier gives us a good example of this. And finally, the Mel de Glace. Chamonix, Mont Blanc in France. The most accessible glacier to us here, and that is going to show us that glaciers are good indicators of climate change. So our first glacier, Franz Josef on the South Island of New Zealand. Really very strong glacial landscape down there. And the Franz Josef is a very often visited glacier. It's a very touristy glacier in a way. There's a picture of it. You walk towards the glacier along the valley bottom and the glacier kind of comes tumbling out of the mountains in the valley. I've drawn a yellow line on the right hand side and this is going to show us a common idea about the glacial budget we call it. How glaciers can grow, advance or shrink, retreat. Above that imaginary yellow line it's high up and we have the inputs into the glacial system. The classic input here obviously is snow. And if there's lots of snow coming into the glacier, the glacier will build up, accumulation occurs, and it's going to grow. The glacier is going to advance. Below the yellow line, we've got the outputs. And the output from a glacier, the main one, of course, is melting. And if the glacier starts to melt a lot, it will retreat. So I'd like you to think of a glacier in terms of a glacial budget. Inputs, the snow, advancing, growing glacier. Outputs, the melting, retreating, shrinking glacier. And the little yellow line there shows there's almost a line that you can kind of think about with the glacier, where above that line there are more inputs than outputs, and below that line there are more outputs than inputs. That line changes from season to season and glacier to glacier, but let's have a think about a glacier as a dynamic place with a budget. So, glaciers are constantly moving. Gravity is obviously acting to pull them downhill, but they're also growing and shrinking, advancing, retreating, a little bit on their own accord. Over a short time scale, they will advance and retreat, winter to summer. But over a longer time scale, the Earth will experience, of course, ice ages and interglacials as we move from really cold areas, times of, 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 the, of the Earth's history, into warmer areas. Question number two. Solheimer Jokul in Iceland. A picture on the left hand side, Google Maps, I really like it. You can see Iceland, you can see the areas of white, these sort of ice caps really. What's noticeable to me, looking at that geographically on the left hand side, is that the ice seems to be in sort of circles. Very interesting. I said before we get glaciers because of altitude or latitude, and the reason why the white areas of snow are relatively round is because they're on top of round-ish mountains, in this case volcanoes. So in Iceland the volcanoes give us the highest land and the snow will accumulate forming ice caps. The photograph, the picture on the right hand side shows the Solheimer Jokul glacier just coming out and down off the ice cap. It's like a ribbon, like a band, like a tongue of white ice that's flowing out of the ice cap. It's a really interesting geography there from the satellite image of Solheimer Jokul. If we go there, this is what it looks like. It's not dry, it's not white, it's not a clean place. The glaciers there, you can see the glacier itself has got lots of dark black marks on it. Yeah, that's a lot of deposition of material, ash from volcanic eruptions, and material from the valley. In front of the glacier, you can see all the melt waters. So even when the glacier is advancing and it's the cold winter season, there's still a lot of melting going on. And there's an awful lot of water coming out from the glacier. 
and that's bringing with it any material the glacier has eroded and transported. And these we call moraines. So if you look at the glacier, it's dirty as such. That's because of all the moraine, all the material that's been transported and deposited. It's very wet as the glacier is constantly melting as it goes through its yearly cycle. So Solheimer Jokul shows us that glaciers aren't white and dry and pristine. They're quite sort of dirty, moraine, wet areas and landscapes. Next glacier, Bruto Marino in Argentina. Um, you can see on the left hand side picture there lots of uh, ice and snow on top of the Andes and then there's quite a big glacier coming out from the mountains. Perito Marino is a very famous glacier. You'll have seen it in lots of pictures. It's a very tourist site, very touristy site. If you look at it, there we go on the left hand side. That's my photograph from 2000. A bit of a cloudy day. I can't compete with the photograph on the right hand side where it's a sunny day. Picture there, take off from Google the images. And what's remarkable about the Perito Marino is its colour, and this indicates that glaciers do change as they get older. If we look at the, the snout at the front end of the glacier, the Perito Moreno has extremely vivid, clear blues, very dark blues, quite beautiful colours. And basically over time, as the pressure builds up, the ice is squeezed, the, the air is sort of squeezed out really, and there's an increase in density. And as this happens, the ice gradually changes from a, a whitish colour to a blue colour. So basically, blue ice is old ice. Okay. Also, the end of the glacier, the snout of the glacier, we get something called carving, where bits of the ice fall off. And then Perito Moreno, lots of video clips about the, uh, the end of the glacier, the snout of the glacier, and carving occurring as huge blocks of ice uh, fall off. Okay. So as glaciers age, they change, particularly clear, older ice becomes bluer. Great Glacier. Chile, still in South America. This one you can see on the image on the left hand side, you can see the glacier and you can see the pattern, this sort of linear pattern. It looks like it's flowing and often we describe a glacier flowing a little bit like water, it behaves a bit like a liquid. It's an old thought maybe, but it does flow and move uh, due to glaciers, does ice. Now Grey Glacier is, is huge. In 1996, NASA estimated the glacier as being 28 kilometers long, covering an area of 270 square kilometers. This is a vast area um, of ice. And it's quite a famous one because scientists have studied it quite a bit recently and it is retreating. Um, so looking at Grey Glacier, even though we can think that there's a huge amount of ice, and maybe a little bit being lost doesn't matter, well, it might do. And we need to be aware that small changes in glaciers can be important. This photograph also shows that glaciers we can see a little bit like rivers. They flow, they move downhill through gravity, and they have things such as tributaries. So as a, a river will have a smaller tributary river entering and joining up with it, so glaciers have the same. And you can see in the image a little tributary glacier flowing into the main glacier. Also, maybe hard to see, um, yeah, I'm down there in, in, in the foreground as well. Kills hiding. Anyway, there you go. So there's the Grey Glacier in, in Chile. Final glacier, closest one to where we are, I suppose, probably the most accessible. Mer de Glace, Chamonix Mont Blanc in France. Quite a touristy glacier, an area with a lot of visitors per year. Here's a representation of the area, the Mont Blanc mountain. Uh, the Mer de Glace is, is the glacier that comes off this area. And you can see down in the valley bottom uh, the settlement of Chamonix, primarily a tourist centre, ski resort. So we're going to look at the glacier of the Mer de Glace. Here it is. Now hopefully looking at that um, image, you're reminded of a few things we've already covered. I'm hoping you can see that glaciers are moving downhill under the force of gravity. I'm hoping you remember that glaciers are found in places with high latitude or high altitude. We're in the Alps and you can see mountains. So this is obviously an altitude uh, glacier. Flowing, you can see how it's curving, it's moving glacier. You can see the curves um, from the photograph. It's flowing downhill, it's moving. 
moraines. Hopefully now you're using the word moraine rather than just dirt. You can see in the photograph that glacier is more gray than it is white. It's all the material, all the moraines that have fallen onto the glacier from the sides of the valley through freeze thaw weathering or have been eroded by the glacier. It's full of moraine and it looks like a dynamic place. It's a dynamic landscape. So, Mer de Glace Chamonix, indicator of climate change. Yeah, that's my thumb, indeed. And you can see the landscape. Now, I'm about to walk down to the glacier, down the side of, of the uh, valley. As I said before, it's quite a touristy area. And as you're walking down to the glacier, you start to realize what is happening over time in this area. As you're walking down, there are little signs in place which show you the level of the glacier over past years. The first one you come across is the 1990 glacier. Now, in terms of glaciers and geological time, it's not perhaps a long, long time. So you look at that and you think, goodness me, not that long ago, the glacier was at that height. And I've still got quite a long way to walk down till I get to the glacier. It's a big change. Carry on walking down. And then you reach another side, the level of the glacier, 2001. And we've still got quite a long way to go till we get down the side of the valley to the glacier itself. So there's been a drastic amount of melting, shrinking, retreating of this glacier in very recent time scale. And it really does show you the, the impact of climate change and the changes taking place. By the way, just look at the rock in this photograph, nice and smooth, clearly showing you glacial erosion has been taking place. Get down to the glacier itself, you can go inside it, there's some tunnels, you can, you can go there, you, you can visit. And you can see a number of tunnels. Uh, basically what's happening is the glacier is moving downhill, as we know. So each year for the tourists, they dig a new hole and you can go in and you can look around. But of course the glacier is moving down hill and therefore a new sort of hole new tunnel has to be dug every year go inside you can see different things there's different sculptures and things look at the fact the uh, glacier the ice is blue hopefully you're realizing now blue ice that's obviously older ice you can also see particularly in the left hand photograph at the top there a little bit of black sediment that's a bit of moraine that's been sort of caught stuck into the glacier itself. So we've got examples here of moraine within the glacier and the idea of glacial ice as it ages becoming bluer. Up out on the side of the valley, there's the glacier itself. Again, it's covered in moraine. The glacier looks more gray than it does white. And you can see the tunnels from year to year as they keep moving down, we've got to create a new tunnel. Okay. And there we go. There are five glaciers. Um, this slide just shows you that um, glaciation is relevant to us in terms of our exams. This is a, a, an A-level, um, it's an AQA question from a few years ago. Quite a complicated question, but understanding glaciers and glacial landscapes is, is very much important for us um, academically. Um, and there we have our five glaciers, the stories they tell. So Franz Joseph, they are dynamic, they grow, they change. Solheimer Jokl. They're not white and dry by any means. They're kind of quite dirty, moraine, and very wet places with meltwaters. Frito Marino, places change, they age. In this case, that becoming blue is a sign of, of age, of course. Grey Glacier, they can be vast places, but small changes that do happen to them can be important, and we shouldn't ignore this. And then finally, the Mer de Glace. Uh, glaciers can indicate climate change and are changing probably quicker than we realise. If you want to know more, a um, good website is this one, swissedu.ch, um, gives you lots of very definitive definitions and pictures of glacial uh, landscapes. Uh, it's a good photo glossary there. It's a really good source of information for anybody who wants to know more about glaciation. And there's all the, the key terms and all sorts of things that you can investigate and have a look at. And there we go. So there you go. That was a slightly shorter version of the uh, lecture that was given uh, back in January 2019 um, about glaciers. Um, and I hope you've learned something and enjoyed it. Okay.